Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the conference on the shoulders of Everett. My name is Charles Bedard. I am a postdoc researcher at the University of Lugano, and I am pleased to be one of your hosts this week. I co-organized this conference together with uh, Samuel Kuipers, a DPhil student in physics at the University of Oxford. You will have the chance to meet him a lot through, through the week. Uh, we are both extremely actually surprised and pleased to see such a large number of participants. Um, as a small anecdote, I was quite stressed yesterday because there was an upper limit to 100 people on the Zoom account. And I'm like, well, we need to upgrade this because the registrations are going really well. And in fact, in eight people, we're going to be uh, exceeding that previous limit. Um, so yeah, the, our motivation to organize this conference is to present and discuss the advancements uh, as well as the far-reaching consequences of Everett's stake on quantum theory. Um, we hope that uh, we will, you will all make the most of it and that you will um, be involved in good discussions and that you will enjoy the talks. Um, in terms of logistics, I will quickly cut and paste the, the web link in the chat um, about the conference schedule. So here it is. Uh, that's going to be our conference schedule for the week. Be aware that the time on this schedule is BST. That means British summertime. That's UTC plus one. Although uh, the fact that I'm advertising this to you, you are definitely not the right public because you obviously made it on time, but <laughs> share it to your peers if some of your peers are still lost in time. Um, as you can see from the schedule, there will be two 10 minute breaks um, every day and one 40 minute break. Uh, please be free to use some of the breakout rooms that we've set out for you. So you can actually use those rooms in the breaks if you want to have them some quick chats with, with colleagues, or also be free to use them uh, during discussions uh, or uh, during um, talks, whatever they are there for you to use. And uh, as you can see also from the schedule, at the end of each day, there will be a discussion period. Everyone is welcome to join at this discussion period. The, um, the talks and discussions period will be recorded and later on made available on the website. So um, on that, that kind of wraps up the general remarks about this conference. And um, I'll be the chair for this morning's session. Um, so the program for this morning is that we have a talk followed by a short break, and then another talk followed by a longer break. And um, on that, I'm pleased to uh, right away announce our first speaker. And let me just, since we have time before the official time of the schedule, I'm going to make the announcement and the presentation of the speaker. And then, um, Zurek, you'll have time to uh, you know, say, get, get yourself organized. So yeah, I kind of scoop myself. Our first speaker is uh, Wojciech Zurek. Um, and we're really pleased to have him here as, a, as the icebreaker of the conference. Zurek is well known for having developed the theory of decoherence with uh, some very important explanations as to why and when systems become quasi-classical. Um, Jurek is also known from uh, kind of every undergrad known, knows Jurek from his famous snow cloning theorem that he um, did together with uh, Wouters. So um, Jurek, you have some, let's say two or three minutes to get organized. Um, make sure you can share your screen and we will try and keep pace on the schedule. So we'll start your talk at, uh, at 3.10. Okay, so it isn't perfect because I couldn't log in from the computer on which I have my real talk. So uh, in a big hurry, I transferred uh, uh, the PPT file from uh, the other computer. And so you will notice uh, that some of the, of the fonts are really weird. <laughs> uh, <down the> <laughs> okay, so okay, what I will blame it on you. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> okay, 
so what I will tell, tell you about is um, uh, how our perception, and I emphasize the word perception of the classical emerges in the quantum universe. Um, there are a bunch of papers and, and you see some of them listed here uh, that I wrote on the subject. Um, I, how it relates uh, to Everett's views, uh, I uh, will let you decide. I think one main thing that Everett stressed and which I avail myself of is that uh, quantum theory should be enough or should be key to interpreting quantum theory. Uh, let me uh, uh, lay the groundwork. Uh, I will uh, tell you uh, uh, what are the tenets of uh, what I believe is a textbook quantum theory and which of them I like and which of them I don't like. So here they are listed. Um, state of a composite system lives in a tensor product of Gauss-Dieu and Hilbert spaces. Uh, superposition principle, evolutions are unitary. Immediate repetition of a measurement yields the same outcome, predictability. Uh, notice that the zeros through three are, are in, in blue uh, or red, which are sort of neutral col colors. Then the colors become red because these are textbook axioms, but axioms that are really inconsistent, in particular with unitary, unitarity of the evolution. And notice also, uh, I have, uh, let's see. Yeah. Notice also that axioms zero through two are just mass, nothing but mass. And this is what we do as theorists. Uh, we shuffle around uh, uh, vectors in Hilbert spaces. But uh, shuffling symbols in, digital, uh, in, in, in Hilbert spaces is not physics. Number three begins to make a connection. And I'm going to rely on that connection. Number four is a collapse axiom. Uh, uh, two pieces, outcomes are restricted to orthogonal uh, uh, eigenstates of the measured observable, and just one outcome is seen each time. And number five is Bond's rule. And I will basically try to derive as much as I can out of, of four and five from zero to three. So this is a plan. Um, somehow it doesn't want to go to the next one. Yes, so these are my uh, uh, foundations. And the key question is, why do we perceive our quantum world as classical? Now, uh, I've got 50 minutes. Uh, I don't know how far I'll get with my talk within 50 minutes. Uh, so let me uh, try to cut to the chase and tell you uh, where I would like to end up. So what I would like to end up is telling you about quantum Darwinism. And I just go through the points one by one. Uh, uh, so point number one, typical observers such as us do not interact with the systems they are interested in. I mean, very clearly, I do not interact with you directly and I'm interested in some of you. Uh, systems and observers are based yeah, through the coherence, many records of the states of the system are imprinted on that environment. The environment carries these records away where they can be accessed by observers. So this is how we get our information. This happens often extremely rapidly. I'll try to give you an idea of how fast. Many redundant copies uh, ensure that observers will agree. This is the origin of objective classical reality. Now, there are two points which are crucial in, in this story. One of them, you need to have states of systems of interest that are not disturbed by the process of copying because you need to make plenty of copies. Two, you need to at some point evaluate how much information there is in the environment about the system. To evaluate information, you need probabilities. So you need probabilities. This will come up as we go along. Uh, let me start 
uh, 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 with, with a, a slide on what I will basically bypass, which is decoherence. You know all of, about this. Um, uh, decoherence ein selection, which stands for environment induced super selection point two basis. Uh, we all know the story. There is an initial state of uh, the. Uh, by the way, do you see my uh, cursor as I move it on the screen? Yes. Good. Uh, um, so you start with with the initial state of the system and a, st and a state of the environment. Uh, they entangle Schrodinger equations, unitary evolution. You get some uh, horrible, huge state of both. If you are interested in the system alone, you can trace over the environment uh, and you will end up with a density matrix. Uh, the interesting thing or the surprising thing or the thing that makes the coherence important is that when you do that, essentially regardless of what are the initial states of the system and the environment, you will end up with the same set of states on the diagonal of the density matrix. So there is a preferred basis. If you had started in one of these states, you would have, uh, uh, that state would have survived decoherence. So in some sense, we have hint of an answer to the question I asked before, um, uh, what states can survive interaction with the environment? And um, the key to the answer is not so much what happens in the diagonal of an operator like a density matrix, because uh, rho is a Hermitian operator, it can be always diagonalized, is what does the interaction between the system and the environment prefer? And uh, a condition uh, which works in some, but not all circumstances is this commutation. So, you know, we have great story, uh, we have, uh, um, uh, a way to tell what the events are. And I think it's a good story, uh, but there is a fly in the ointment. And the fly is that this story depends, decoherence depends on Born's rule. Why? Well, because when you do the tracing, tracing is a mathematical operation beyond suspicion, you will end up with an object, but that object you will interpret as a physical, statistical entity. And in order to justify that interpretation, you need to assume Born's rule, Born's rule because that basically says that you've averaged over the environment. When you average, you involve probabilities. So from now on until when I lift that prohibition, we are not going to do either tracing or uh, 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 use density matrices. And yet we need to come up with a prescription for states which are uh, preferred, which survive process of copying, because that's you know, what we need for quantum derivatives. So all of this can be legally questioned. Uh, and uh, um, even though we've had events uh, uh, that uh, uh, Self-congratulatory uh, uh, statement has to be uh, erased. So the program is, we're gonna start with axioms zero through three, uh, mathematics plus repeatability. Uh, why measurement outcomes are limited to orthogonal set of possible uh, states in Hilbert space events is our question number one. Why does Born rule here probably is question number two and quantum Darwinism uh, is going to be number three. Let's start with events. Our hands are tied, no tracing, no density matrices. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to say is actually, uh, uh, in some sense, a consequence of no cloning, like looking at, 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 at the world, uh, because I'm going to try to make a measurement on a state and here are the two states, U and V. Here's an apparatus starts in a state A0. Measurement will only mean that the state of the system, U, influence the state of the apparatus. So A0 goes into AU, same for, for V, right? I am within axioms zero through three. So unitarity is, is law. Uh, so um, this, leads to a consequence, and I'm gonna skip the long derivation, I'm just going 
cut to the chase. I can multiply, I can do scalar products of the left-hand side, the right-hand sides, and this should be an equality. So these things are equal. So we have a beautiful equation. When you have an equation like this, a temptation is to simplify. So let's simplify, divide by the common factor. What's the consequence? It's a disaster. We've just proved that measurements cannot happen. Why? Well, because AU, AV is equal to A0, A0, which is one, which means that AU is equal to AV. So where did we go wrong? Well, we've divided by something that could be possibly zero. So this is a solution to our dilemma. Only when the two states which are being copied are orthogonal, can they uh, uh, be copied. If there is a slightest hint of non-orthogonality, this is out. Note that these copies need not be perfect. As long as AU, AV is not equal to one, I have this conclusion. So even very poor copying is going to lead me there. Um, so what do I have? Predictability, U stays U, V stays V, implies a restriction to orthogonal states. This is a discreteness that hints at the origin of quantum jumps. Indeed, of the reason for collapse. If you want to do things which end up being able to be measured and remeasured and remeasured, because you could have had many different up, uh, apparatuses doing the same thing, you need to have seeds like U and V, which are orthogonal. Let's uh, summarize. Derivation of quantum jumps, key to collapse postulate uh, that uh, uh, explains uh, 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 discreteness. Uh, it implies that observables are Hermitian. Once you have orthogonality, observables become, have to be Hermitian. Proof can be extended uh, to when the apparatus, the environment is in a mixed state initially. It's a bit more complicated uh, Hilbert Schmidt norms rather than uh, scalar products, as well as to mixed decohering states. In fact, you can prove uh, essentially the same thing even for an open system. Axiom three, predictability, repeatability is in some sense key to the proof. And information transfer need not be due to deliberate measurement. Any escape of information from the system is going to give you uh, this conclusion. So in a sense, this is what we need for quantum darkness. We have distinguishable events, moreover. So we can now proceed. Where do we proceed? Maybe uh, instead of, of proceeding immediately, let me ask if there are any immediate questions. And I think, you know, at this point, questions of interpretation should be put off until the discussion at the end. But if there are any clarifications which are uh, would, would be helpful, uh, please do not hesitate. Okay, I assume everything was crystal clear. Um, so we proceed. We proceed to derive Born's rule. So uh, old idea of, of, of how to go about it. Um, uh, I think goes back to, to, to uh, the likes of Bernoulli and Cardano and was codified by Laplace. In any case, probability theory uh, owes its uh, origins to French aristocrats. Uh, they gambled. Uh, they lost uh, large amounts of money, horses, etc., cetera, and, uh, because they didn't know how to gamble. Uh, so uh, they enlisted uh, the help of French mathematicians to teach them. Uh, and that was the beginning of a probability theory. Uh, so here are two cards. One of them is a spade, and I know that for sure. And Laplace's view of where probability comes from is that if I am indifferent to how the cards are shuffled, uh, I will uh, assign probability uh, of one half 
to getting a spade. Now, this is flagrantly subjective, right? Because if I'm sitting under the table and uh, 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 there is a glass, uh, uh, I see that th this matters. Uh, which card is nearer to me will depend on, on, on what happens. So this is not physics in some sense, it is psychology. And this has, I mean, I, I think there are very nice things about it, uh, but this was how this was attacked and how frequentists uh, uh, in some sense uh, took the field uh, to a large extent. Now, you can't do anything about it. Uh, uh, quantum mechanically, uh, classically. Uh, but you know, one point on which Laplace put his hand is that here we have an example of invariance, hence we have an example of symmetry. How can we use it uh, uh, without psychology? The interesting thing is that in quantum theory we can. So let us imagine two entangled cards in two different places, S and E, two different locations. It's an entangled state. I do Laplace's trick. I shuffle cards on table S. I get a global state, which is orthogonal to the state from which I've started. Now I can shuffle cards on the other table, right? Here I shuffled on S, here I shuffle an E. So even though I didn't touch S, lo and behold, I end up with a state at which I, which I have had at the very beginning. Laplace's point about symmetry was that there are situations where you can prove equiprobability based on subjective uh, 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 view of, 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 of what probability is. Here we have, a, in a some sense, objective symmetry. It's not in your mind. It's in entanglement. Probabilities will be equal because I have shuffled things so that probabilities would have been changed. And yet, without touching the system S, which was shuffled, I've restored uh, the state of the universe as a whole, so to say. So probabilities must be the same. So the only case in which probabilities can be exchanged and remain the same is when they are equal. So I have a proof of equiprobability and uh, let me proceed and make it slightly more formal. Uh, I'm going to uh, consider uh, an entangled state. Um, I'm going to um, uh, basically repeat what I did with cards. Right, so here I have an entangled quantum state. Uh, it has n, uh, lives in n, or there are n non-zero uh, uh, coefficients. Uh, instead of shuffling cards, I'm going to apply a swap operator. So I'm going to exchange SK with SL. Right? I have a different state if I do this, but I can restore the original state by exchanging EK with EL. So by the same token as before, I can prove that probabilities of all the events associated with the states SK must be equal. And phases just go for a ride. Phases are very easily uh, um, uh, uh, canceled out or, 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 or undone. So if there is a rotation which happens at this end, you can unrotate things by acting on the other end with the operator, which uh, runs things backwards. So I have now uh, the probability. So this is basically what I just said. It's it's a quantum representation of of, of what was done before with the cards, and uh, um, in this case, uh, since I have n possibilities, probability of any of the s case must be one over n. So I have proved uh, equiprobability. Equiprobability is good. Actually, it's a hard part of the proof, uh, but uh, I think many of you would have been willing to accept uh, uh, the uh, uh, fact that if there are equal amplitudes, uh, probabilities must be equal. Still, it's a hard part of the proof. By the way, you can extend it 
uh, you can, for example, prove that a state which appear in this expansion with probability with a coefficient equal to zero must have zero probability. Okay, so there is more. Uh, so once we've done it for equal coefficients, we can generalize it to unequal coefficients. So consider again a system S with just two states, zero and two, and the environment E, which has three states, zero, one, and two. And one of the states of the environment we will use is a plus state, which is zero plus one over square root of two. Um, the initial state of the system and the environment is here. Uh, normalization is actually unnecessary. The only thing that matters is what's in the numerators. So the ratio of the amplitudes. Um, the plus is, as I said, zero plus one. Uh, zero and two are orthogonal, plus and two are also orthogonal. I'm going to fine grain now. Right? I want to make these probabilities equal and then deduce from them what is uh, uh, the uh, uh, probability of zero and probability of two. That's my question. And how do I fine grain? I introduce an extra environment E prime, which interacts with E, so that I basically does a controlled not like generalization to three, uh, uh, three states. So zero and zero within the plus goes to zero, zero. Uh, zero and one within the plus uh, uh, goes uh, to uh, uh, one, one. And two and zero goes to two, two. So now I have an equal amplitude state, zero, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Before I couldn't swap. Notice, if I swapped zero with two and tried to do the things that I did earlier, swap two with plus, I wouldn't have gotten the same state. I can't prove equiprobability. Now I can do that. I can swap zero, zero, for example, with zero, one, and then unswap uh, or undo the swap by swapping the last zero with the last one. I can swap zero, one, and two, two, and again, undo that by swapping two with one. So I conclude that these states must have equal probabilities. And because there's three of them, probability of each of them is one third. Moreover, two appears only once. So probability of two is definitely one third. The, other only, the only other option is, 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 is zero. And that must be two thirds because uh, I, knows that probabilities have to add up to one. So I have Born's rule. Amplitudes got magically squared. You don't need to assume additivity in the sort of strong Kolmogorov sense. It's enough if you say probabilities have to sum up to one. Uh, so let me stop here again and ask if there are any urgent Questions or complaints? Uh, yes. How do you do this trick if the probabilities are irrational? Extremely good question. Uh, I can tell you, uh, I don't have the transparency. That's in the other talk in the computer. It's, but I can, it's, it's trivial. OK? So basically, you can do it always for a rational number. You say continuity. End of story. All right. Okay. Okay, so we are back to our program. And how much time do I have? I would say about 25 minutes still. Uh, exactly. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So we are back to the program deriving controversial axioms four and five from the non controversial, right? What do we have so far? Uh, these were supposed to be check marks. These things look like books. Uh, that's one of the sort of most uh, dramatic changes in, in, in the fonts. Um, uh, so we have events. We know that we can essentially from unitarity and repeatability 
deduce what states uh, are uh, uh, unchanged by the, by the act of copy, okay? We have one rule. So now uh, we go on. How can objective classical reality states we can find out arise from the fragile uh, quantum states that are perturbed uh, uh, usually by measurements, right? We want to have states which can survive our finding out about what they are. You've seen this, but I'm going to go through it again. Uh, we do not interact directly with systems. Systems and observers are based in the environment. The environment decoheres states of the system. And it, in the process, copies the information about these states uh, uh, onto the modes, uh, degrees of freedom of the environment. Through decoherence, many records about the state of the system are imprinted in the environment. What states of the system? Of course, pointer states. They survive the coherence. By the way, by now I am uh, lifting the prohibition uh, um, of, of, of employing Born's rule. We have derived it, so we're gonna use it. The environment carries these records away to where they can be accessed by observers. So many observers are going to get copies uh, of, I, I call them Q-means of the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, states of the system. This can happen very rapidly. And many redundant copies ensure that observers can agree. Uh, let me add here uh, that there is a paper which was posted just a couple of days ago, um, which takes one further step in um, uh, uh, quantifying uh, uh, this, this story. Um, the uh, um, uh, first author is Akram Tuil. Um, and, and what it does, so what we will do through the rest of the talk is use mutual information between the system and a fragment of the environment as an estimate of, the, of what observer can find out about the system from the environment, from that fragment. Uh, that paper that I just mentioned uh, does things more carefully. That mutual information that I just defined is an overestimate. That paper proves that it's not a bad estimate of actually what can be ext extracted from the, from, from the fragment of the environment. So anyway, the conclusion is that because there are many, red, many copies, uh, observers can agree on what is objective. Observers that will meet, shake hands and exchange notes about what they have seen will report to each other that they have seen the same thing, or at least there will be no inconsistency between what they have seen. Okay. So, decoherence paradigm. You had a system, you had the environment. You didn't care about what was in the environment. It just sucked out quantum information and it went somewhere out of reach. You cared about the preferred states of the system. Redundancy or, or, or uh, uh, quantum Darwinism or environment as a witness uh, a paradigm recognizes that the environment is structured. It has pieces, photons, for example. And the question it poses is, suppose you are able to intercept some of these pieces. How much information about the system will you be able to extract from such a fragment of the environment? Um, a quantity which is extremely useful and, and uh, which was used essentially uncritically until 
uh, uh, the paper we, we posted a, f uh, a few days ago, uh, to answer this question is quantum mutual information. So mutual information is entropy of one object S, entropy of another object F, minus entropy of two objects um, taken together. This is the same formula you would use classically. And this will tell you how much these two things know about each other. So for example, if you have two copies of the same book and you don't know what's inside, this entropy and this entropy are equal, but the joint entropy is only as much as you don't know about one of them. So in that case, mutual information would be what the books know about each other, how, how well, if they're the same copy, it would be what you don't know about each, uh, either of them. In quantum uh, uh, physics, we can do the same thing, except now entropy is trace or log log. And it's often useful uh, do logs base too, so you, get, you deal with qubits. It measures information and correlations between S and F. And, the great advantage of this over other quantities, uh, which we investigate in that paper I've mentioned, is that here there is no reference to observables or measurements. It just deals with states of the systems. Uh, it is bounded by twice the entropy of one of these two objects, um, which is actually interesting because classically it would be bounded by <coughs> what was there in the example of the books, which is just once the entropy of these two objects. And we'll get into why this bound is more generous going to make up to, and why it sort of doesn't matter actually for, for emergence of the classical through quantum Darwinism. Um, so we are dealing or we are asking about partial information. How much does the fragment uh, F know about S, how much of the information of S can it supplies? And the redundancy will be defined by answering the question, how many disjoint fragments supply almost all, one minus delta of the information about the system? Um, let's see, I'm missing a transparency here, but maybe it will appear later. Uh, um, uh, uh, but, but let's proceed and, 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 and clarify some of these things. So redundancy, uh, the fact that I'm uh, uh, bold enough to define this, to, to, to answer this, to ask this question, uh, implies that I expect that there will be many copies and it will turn out there are. So let's look at a very simple example. I have a system in a superposition of zero and one, the interaction is going to choose zero and one as pointer basis. And I have the environment, which has uh, just two qubits. So it's a small one, right? Uh, the interaction happens via some controlled knot, which means uh, this state becomes this state. Each fragment, each subsystem of the environment, each qubit of the environment knows the state of the system. Right? If I take part of the environment trace over it, and retain other part of the environment and use it as my fragment, which I cherish and which I use to gain information about the system, I'm going to get always the same sort of density matrix. That is uh, one half zero zero plus one half one one. Uh, so this is a density matrix. Uh, let's see, this is not, I'm stuck. Yeah, okay. So let's look at what happens uh, uh, graphically. I am plotting mutual information as a function of the fraction of the environment I was able to intercept. Nothing happened here yet. This is a state for which I'm gonna plot it. If I just get hold of a single qubit, I know everything about the system. If I manage to get hold of those qubits, well, 
actually, if I manage to get hold of the whole thing, S and E all together, since this is a pure state, the part in the formula for mutual information that I subtract is an entropy of a pure state, entropy of a pure state is zero, right? So uh, let me see if I can go back quickly. No, I can't. Um, so in that case, the mutual information is gonna jump up to twice HS. Classically, it would stay put at single HS. Stuck okay, A bigger environment, three qubits. Same story. One, I got up to where I know everything about the system. Two, I don't know anything more about the system. It just confirms what I, what I already knew. Three, pure state. I go up to two edges. You can guess the rest of the talk. <laughs> One, two, three. You can guess what would have happened if I had N, right? And, and uh, this would be roughly the plot. Jump up to complete information of the system at the first qubit and then plateau on which the information in the environment doesn't increase, but it allows one to share the same information amongst many, amongst E minus, e minus one. Uh, eventually, since the whole thing is in a pure state, you jump up uh, uh, all the way. So this is a classical plot. So of course, an extremely simple uh, 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 illustration of what we are going to try to understand or what I believe is going on uh, in, in the universe as such as ours, which is quantum to the core, but looks classical to us. So redundancy in this case is a number of fragments of the environment which have complete information about the system and the redundancy is E, right? You don't need to use Delta. But in the real world, we do not have uh, yeah, the idealized version of branching states that follow from decoherence. In real world, we do not have controlled knots. We have some much less controlled interactions. And so these plots, if you were to do it for other models, would look like this, right? That would be smoother. And at this point, it starts to make sense to define redundancy more carefully. First of all, the plateau will always hit HS. And if you just want one minus delta of that information, then you can use delta to define redundancy, right? That's your delta is your criterion. It's the information deficit that you are willing to put up with. Uh, and uh, if you get one fragment of the environment, doesn't give you that. If you get two fragments of the environment, still doesn't give you it. Three is a charm, all right? You hit uh, or you go above your criterion. That means that redundancy will be given by the number of subsystems like that in that environment divided by the number of subsystems in a fragment that suffices to give you uh, what you want. So fraction of the environment is what defines redundancy. Redundancy is one over the fraction of the environment that gives you all uh, uh, information except delta. Uh, turns out this is generic. Um, in situations which involve decoherence. It's not generic for random states in a Hilbert space. So here's a schematic of uh, what we have seen, and you will see more of that in, in examples. If you were to pick a random state on a, of the Hilbert space, 
the green line would be representative. Almost nothing would be gained in terms of information until you have half of that environment. And then suddenly you would know almost everything about that state. So almost all quantum states are non-redundant. Green plot before. The redundant states we infer from observations are exceptional. Uh, how does this exceptional uh, uh, exceptionality happens? Well, special initial state, low entropy. Photons have very low entropy compared to what they could have had. Special dynamics, decoherence, which singles our preferred basis. Uh, 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 harking back to the to the part one of the talk where we've selected uh, states which survive interaction with the environment. Um, and now we would like to understand how do these states come about and how do they decay and so on in a realistic model. And I won't be able to go through all of that in my talk. And I have, I think about 10 minutes uh, uh, if, I, if I judge time correctly. 10 minutes directly, that is, that's if we have no time for question. Um, okay, well, let's, let's go on and let's see what happens. So uh, I gave you C notes, I gave you uh, 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 blue and, and uh, um, green and, and red plots. I want to give you some things that actually matters for how we gain information about the uh, universe uh, on a daily basis, okay? Um, we do it through photons. 90 plus percent of information comes through photons. Uh, the rest comes through sound waves, which behave much like photons. But let's focus on photons. That, that's a calculation we've done. So here we have a source of radiation, which emits photons from a single direction, sun, light bulb. Uh, they impinge on a dielectric sphere, dust grain. I'm going to set delta x to one micron and size of the, of the, of the grain to one micron. Uh, delta x is a separation of uh, schrodinger cat like superposition of the dust grain. It is put in a superposition of, of, of two locations. Um, so this is my initial cat state. Uh, amazingly enough, and this is Jess Rydell, uh, um, who was a student uh, in, in, uh, here in, in um, uh, calculation. Um, uh, amazingly enough, this can be solved exactly. Okay, so you can calculate mutual information between a bunch of photons, fragment F, dust grain S, and this is given by the decoherence factor. Decoherence factor, which is how fast coherence between the off-diagonal terms of the Schrodinger cat uh, made out of, of, of dust grain uh, uh, disappears. So tau D is a decoherence term. Uh, I won't, you know, you won't get much out of studying at this formula, uh, but I'll show some pictures. Uh, this was published uh, uh, about 10 years ago in uh, two papers. So here's the mutual information, the same plots you've become familiar with for controlled knots and so on. Uh, they are, uh, it's a family of plots uh, which are parameterized uh, by the decoherence time. Decoherence time. Uh, is, is uh, so, so sorry, the wait time, how long you gather, how long the photon environment gathers information uh, is, is what uh, uh, is expressed in units of decoherence time. Um, here you have uh, one decoherence time, one and a half, et cetera. So as decoherence becomes more convincing, this plot, becomes like a step function. You get to the classical plateau almost instantly. So the conclusion is, if you find even a tiny fraction of the photon environment, you will know this, that the dust grain was either left or right. Superpositions are not to be accessed 
by monitoring the environment. More exact results. The nice thing is that the dependence on the criterion of how good the record is, is, is uh, only logarithmic. So it's a good notion of the record. It's very, very insensitive to how high your standards are. It's linear in time. Photons scatter at the rate which is uh, basically decided of, 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 of when in the day you are uh, and whether there are clouds or not. Um, a redundancy rate is proportional and capped to by decoherence rate. You could have had more mixed environment initially, and then it would not have been able to accept the information that was there to, have, to, to be had. Uh, so production of records necessarily decoheres. The reverse is not true. Decoherence need not imply quantum darkness. An example, sunlight, photons, our dust grain, stopwatch. This process will result in 100 million copies, sorry, in just one nanosecond. So it's an overwhelming abundance of, it's, it's an amplification. It's an overwhelming number of records. And only the records of the pointer states can be inferred from the environment. This is how objective classical reality arises. You don't need to interact with a dust grain to know where it is. You just find out where it is from the photons that scatter from it. Summary, quantum theory of the classical. Quantum states are fragile. Only unselected pointer states survive decoherence intact. Observers intercept fragments of the environment to obtain information about systems of interest, quantum Darwinism. Therefore, only states that can survive decoherence and repeated copying, part one of the talk, can be found out, explaining emergence of objective, objective reality. Existence of preferred states can be inferred without using Born's rule, explaining one observable Zahar mission. Again, part one. Uh, we haven't used decoherence until we were uh, legally entitled to use it, which is because decoherence involves Born's rule. Um, Born's rule can be derived using symmetries of quantum entanglement. Uh, I call this process entanglement assisted invariance or invariance and emergence of objective classicality in the quantum universe can be understood with minimal consistent purely quantum postulates in the quantum credo zero through three the yellow part if you have vague recollection of i think transparency two or three and uh, some of that is summarized in, in this physics today article and here's my initial transparency and here's my final transparency Thank you. I'm done. Wow. Thank you, Zurek. Thank you very much for the super nice talk, Zurek. Really enjoyed it. Um, we are two minutes ahead of the break, so uh, we have time for a question. And of course, in the breaks, uh, the breaks, I, we will, they will be um, unstructured. So of course, discussions can take place, um, but typically don't expect them to be monitored uh, or structured. So we have a question a long time ago from uh, Babak. Babak, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question if it still Thank is you. a question? So um, I think maybe my question echoes some of the discussion in the chat. Uh, I had two questions, but maybe in the interest of time, we just ask one, which is uh, when you were talking about probabilities uh, and you know, deriving uh, Born's rule. Yes. Uh, it, it sounded like you're going in, a, in the probabilities, but on the other hand, um, uh, I think at the end, it, it, it turned out to be a sort of a subjective thing depending on this invariance uh, structure. Or maybe no, so, 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 so it's a good question because there is no single simple answer. <laughs> but let me give you my thinking about it. So, so if you have an entangled state, then the symmetries on which the probabilities are based are objective, right? You have that symmetry of an entangled state and you can prove that you know nothing if the entanglement is bell-like 
about either of the member of the entire pair, right? So this is ironclad objective, right? There's nothing uh, uh, to nitpick about subjectivity there. It implies subjectivity. And that is a sneaky way in which uh, there is a bit of, uh, I don't know that subjectivity is a good word, uh, but uh, where the information sort of gets in, in, uh, invited uh, into the party a priori, uh, which is that you need to know you have an entangled state, right? So you need to know what you know in order to prove that you can't know. But it's, it's uh, you know, I think in some sense, I mean, this is definitely not Laplace-like invariance because you could prove it uh, for, uh, I mean, the part that knows that there is an entangled state need not be uh, uh, mind. It can be another system. But symmetry and the proofs that I gave you is based on objective symmetry. Okay. Well, but would you say that the Born rule in terms of the formula um, um, that you showed uh, still would presume the sort of some notion of probability itself. So it's not that you're deriving a probability, but you're deriving the rule for the probability. So I'm not sure I would agree, right? Because what I do is I assume certainty. Mm -hmm. I assume that something will happen. And I assume that this and its negation add up to one. And this is enough, right? Yeah, but what is this, the, the, <laughs> that function that you're defining? Uh, what is that? Oh, um, it, can, it is related, for example, to frequencies of outcomes, right? And that's probably what I should have mentioned. There is a physical review letter, I think, 19, uh, sorry, 2011, uh, which does it. And I, I, I think that the title, or, or at least the abstract, has, um, uh, you know, uh, says inverting, inverting uh, 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 Born's rule. Uh, and the object of it is uh, uh, to show uh, in a setting which is very much Everett-like. That is, you know, I have alpha uh, uh, zero plus beta one, that the frequencies that you're gonna deduce after you have umpteen uh, 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 instantiations of the state are going to be exactly like that. And the point is, I do not need to assume that I go to infinity, or I do not need to ascribe a priori to the amplitudes, any notion of probability. I show which ones are equiprobable within this huge sums that I'm going to get from you know, raising this to power n by the virtue of invariance, right? And this tells me that square of the pre-existing amplitude and the frequencies I'm gonna get end up being the same thing when n is large. And otherwise it's, you know, Laplace de Moivre. Thank you. All right, I see another uh, uh, hand raised. If anyone cares to go for a break, please be free. Of course, uh, <laughs> you do your own things. Uh, but uh, a question from Maximilian Locke. Uh, Max, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, yes. Um, yeah, thanks for this uh, nice talk. Um, my question was about uh, the, the, the word events that popped up a few times on the screen, but I wasn't quite sure exactly what you were referring to. I mean, it's, this is a very interesting question to me, like this, the, the, uh, the question of when the, the time of occurrence of a thing in quantum mechanics is somehow unclear. Um, and yet seems to be quite important, especially from a the perspective of kind of making connections with gravity and space time and these kinds of things. And so I, I, I'm kind of assuming this is maybe what you're getting at, but maybe I'm reading too much into it.
described justly by the word amplification are objective enough in the sense that they will not be rolled back and they are events. Now, whether you're gonna, if you have a decoherence, you know, scattering of photons, et cetera, whether you're gonna say the event happened after a after, uh, hundred photons scattered or a hundred million photons scattered, or uh, you have to wait for a minute or something, I don't know, right? But the point is uh, that uh, the states define what happened. When they define that, I'm gonna be agnostic about it, right? And the, but the question would depend on, 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 the, uh, uh, on my criterion for how big redundancy is to be. That's one. And two, I think the way we operate in our universe, which is quantum, but we seem to think it's classical, is, is uh, by presuming that redundancy is infinite. So these events are objective. Right, I mean, and it, you know, as far as our powers of changing the wave function, they are objective. So an event is somehow uh, like in, in a moment of ir irreversibility, like however you want to kind of define that. In the end, the cut is somehow arbitrary, but when things get kind of large enough to be irreversible, that's what you're defining, isn't it? So I don't know whether large enough is, is the only criteria, right? I mean, I think people since Boltzmann, uh, uh, and classical physics uh, started uh, focusing on, on what happens or oh, how can you deduce it. And I think, you know, there are, there were deep insights in there, but I, there's a very simple process which gives you irreversibility. A single photon scatters from my brain and goes off. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna catch up with it. It's all over, it's irreversible, right? And somehow uh, this aspect uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't been appreciated enough. So it's more of a, like an operational restriction than somehow that determines irreversibility. Uh, well, I would say there are several possible uh, sensible causes for, so there is a paper by the way, which I published in, one of the journals of, of, of the British society, I think it's by the Proceedings of Philosophical Transactions, um, which has <sighs> it's published in the same volume in which the paper Quantum Theory of Classical Quantum Jumps, etc., which is the middle of the references here, uh, uh, has appeared, right? Which basically asks and answers the question, what is the difference between the irreversibility and reversibility between quantum and classical setting? And it turns out there is a profound difference. And basically the essence of the difference that in classical physics, you can find out about the system, you can have the information about its state, and yet you can reverse the evolution of that system. So you can retain information, you can keep it, and, and, and the, 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 the dynamical evolution of the system is gonna be reversed. If you do the same thing with quantum system, it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? So I think, uh, I don't think uh, uh, finding a single guilty party uh, uh, for irre irreversibility is, is uh, you know, necessarily uh, uh, the right approach. I think there are several situations, including Boltzmann's one, uh, which in different circumstances will dominate. And I think generally they conspire or maybe they just work together, right? I mean, if you have a gas which um, uh, went on and, and, and uh, is not completely isolated, then within its Poincaré cycle, there is going to be photon which is going to bounce off something and go off and it's all over. Right? If you gain information about something, you can't reverse it quantumly. Classically, you could. Right? And all of these things conspire and make irreversibility irreversible. I feel like I could keep, ask, keep asking questions, but uh, I think I probably used up uh, my individual time. So, so uh, yeah, thanks for your answers. Mm -hmm.